Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I have quite an unusual episode for you today. I call this one, I saw an alien through the window of a UFO. I know that might sound a little bit arbitrary, but it's really not. This is actually a pretty sharply defined category of UFO encounters. A lot of cases where people are driving along or perhaps walking outside or are in their home and they're alerted to an object outside and they are all seeing these objects, these UFOs, very low, generally at treetop level or even lower. And there's a large picture window usually or a bunch of portholes and people are seeing these humanoids right through the window. And not only that, seeing right inside the UFO itself. So yeah, it's an interesting category of UFO encounters that goes beyond a mere sighting, perhaps not quite as extensive as a landing, though in a few cases the UFO did apparently land. Uh, these are not onboard experiences, though that may have happened in a couple of these cases. But yeah, these are cases where people saw an alien through the window of a UFO. And they have a lot to say and to teach us actually about UFOs, the shapes they come in, the types of humanoids they are, and more particularly, why they are behaving in this way. So, today I have 14 cases I'd like to present to you. These are coming from all over the world. They reach way back to the 1950s, all the way up to the pretty much present day, the 2000s. So, over many, many decades. And these involve all kinds of witnesses, and in many of these cases, multiple witnesses. A good number of these cases do involve physical evidence of various kinds. And uh, also many, many different types of humanoids. So some very interesting aspects to this. This is going to be quite a lengthy episode. I have 14 cases. That's a lot. So let's just dive right in. The first case I'd like to talk about occurred in Seat Pleasant, Maryland. And what I like about this case is it's such an early case, 1952 actually, which predates pretty much the vast majority of humanoid reports. This is before the contactee era of George Adamski, Truman Bethram, Howard Menger, Daniel Fry. People just weren't talking about humanoids. And yet here's a case of a witness who saw a UFO very close up in her backyard and through the window of it saw a humanoid. It was a hot summer evening in August of 1952 around 9.30 p.m. when Suzanne Knight was in her kitchen and heard a strange buzzing noise. She first thought it was an insect, but looking out she saw a glowing object shooting down very quickly at about a 45 degree angle. She first thought it might be a crashing plane, but then the object stopped and it hovered about a half block away, only 300 feet in the air, so pretty low. She said it was silver in color, lined with square portholes illuminated by a yellow light, and looking through these portholes, she saw what looked like strange rows of cabinets with slanted tops. Now the craft itself, she said, looked like a wingless fuselage of an airplane, and on the top left side front of the object, she saw a bright red light. There was also a bottom section, like a gondola off of a dirigible, she said, that had a smaller row of square windows. And it was through these windows that she saw what looked like seats. And I'll just let Suzanne describe in her own words seeing someone inside this UFO. As she says, there was a man in front looking straight ahead towards the front. I couldn't understand what he was looking at so intently, and not moving either. I expected to see a lot of instruments or dials, etc., similar to instrument panels on airplanes, but there were none that I could see. She said that everything inside this craft looked yellow from the yellow light inside, and the man was wearing a helmet of some kind, and she watched this for about a minute and then left to call the newspaper. Nobody answered the phone, so she hung up and returned to the window. 
The craft was still there, but she could no longer see the figure. And as Suzanne says, I thought maybe it had moved up into the fuselage because not even an outline of the guy was visible. But it should have been because the street light would have shown it. So suddenly the object, the lights on the object went out. The craft, which had been silver, now glowed red. And it began to rock forward and back. And Suzanne saw what looked like heat waves emanating from the craft itself. At this point, she called for her sister, who was in the house, to also come see this object. But her sister didn't respond. So Suzanne quickly rushed to find her. And when they returned to the window, the object was gone. Suzanne's sister seemed a little bit skeptical, but Suzanne was absolutely sure she saw something very unusual. But this is interesting because following the incident, she completely forgot about it until years later. And it wasn't until 1967, almost 15 years later, that she reported the sighting to NICAP, the National Investigative Committee for Aerial Phenomena, who investigated the case, interviewed her, and were unable to account for the object as a conventional aircraft. Yes, that is a single witness case, but it does fit the pattern we see in so many of these other cases as we shall see. And this next case is by no means a single witness. The whole family saw it. This occurred in Ranton, England, and this case became very well known. You may have heard of it before, but it's such a marvelous case. <laughs> with multiple witnesses and physiological effects and more. It's not just one event, but I think it's an important case with a lot to say. So that's why I wanted to include it in this compilation. And yeah, it's a wild case. The primary witness in this case is Jessie Rostenberg. Again, she's not the only witness, but it had been all that day on October 21st, 1954, Jessie had been feeling strange, quote, tingles all day. Now, she had had prior events with psychic precognition, so she was pretty sure that something unusual was going to happen, and it did. It was at 4.45 p.m. on that day when two of Jessie's children, Anthony, age 8, and Ronald, age 6, were in the backyard. Jessie heard a loud crashing sound and rushed outside, to find her two boys lying on the ground, terrified. And directly above them, very low, was a huge saucer-shaped object with a dome on top. And that was amazing enough, but staring down at her children, Jessie saw two, quote, unsmiling human-like creatures with long faces and long hair. So Jesse describes this craft as being about 15 to 20 feet in diameter, a dull metallic silver, and the outer rim, she said, appeared to be rotating. It was totally silent. The beings, she said, had white skin, long hair, very high foreheads, so that their features were almost entirely on the bottom of their face. She said they were both wearing transparent helmets, kind of like a fishbowl, and a blue one-piece uniform that kind of reminded her of ski suits. So I'll just let Jessie describe in her own words this experience. As she says, To my amazement there, suspended on the top of the roof of this old farm, was this object that I can only describe as a huge Mexican hat. It was that shape, without the bobbles. It must have been 15 to 20 yards from where I stood. It covered the roof. So in circumference, it must have been about 60 feet. It was enormous. The people in the spacecraft were just looking out. I could see them from the waist to the top of their heads. They were very beautiful people. They had long golden hair, and they just looked at us. Their eyes, the expression in their eyes, were full of compassion. They just looked, and I was absolutely paralytic with fear. I couldn't move although my mind was taking over. And they seemed so sympathetic that I was mesmerized. It seemed to be ages, but it could have only been seconds. It felt like hours passed, but it must have been seconds. Time was suspended. I was also paralyzed. 
It was like I was in a vice, but my mind was working overtime. Then all of a sudden, I felt the tension leaving me and I felt movement, and I turned around to touch my children, and when I looked again, it was gone. So they all rushed back inside, and Jesse went to fetch some paper and pencils so they could all sketch what they had just seen, and that's when her two boys called out that the UFO had returned again. So they all ran outside and watched this craft circle the house two or three times and then streak skywards, and it was gone. Now Jesse's husband, Tony, hadn't seen the craft, but he had a feeling that it might come back, and he kept a sharp eye on the sky. And sure enough, he was right. Three days later, on October 24, the UFO, or probably a different one because it was larger, came down and maneuvered in a long semicircle curve around the house about one mile away. He called out to Jesse, and there was another guest in the house. They all moved, came out and watched this craft move off. And then, two months later, December 15, another UFO returned, a glowing, fiery object which descended slowly until a plane appeared and apparently scared this object off. So this affected them all really profoundly, particularly the children. Jesse's younger daughter, Karen, began crying much more than she had before, and she said her boys also began acting up. As Jesse says, I can see a tremendous change in them. Whether it's a reaction after their fright or what, I don't know, but they are much naughtier now than they have ever been before it happened. So Jesse was also so stressed out that she broke out in a rash. As she says, it's on my face and arms, and I don't know what it is, just nerves. The same as my edginess and bad temper. So afterwards, Jessie says she felt both revitalized and also a little bit ill. And in fact, she lost quite a bit of weight. It concerned her so much, she visited the doctor and learned that her blood count had dropped dramatically. And the doctor told her, you know, it's crazy to say this, but I'm wondering if you have ever been exposed to radiation. So <laughs> these are some interesting physiological effects, but emotional as well. Uh, Jesse's husband, Tony, c confirms that all of them felt changed. As he says, That old cottage, ever since that UFO hovered over it, something snapped there and almost made us snap too. So the family was so dramatically affected by this encounter that they ended up moving. And this move did bring immediate relief. Things began to get back to normal but never fully back to normal because Jesse says that following this encounter, her psychic abilities increased massively. As she says, it was, quote, great, almost extreme development of ESP. I know things about people. I understand situations. All this probably sounds crazy, but it is true. Ultimately, despite all the weird after effects. She did feel like it was a positive experience. She kept sensing the ETs around, even sometimes perhaps seeing them in her house, and she felt that the ETs were watching over her and her family. And she says, I think they'll be there when I need them. Yeah, I like that case for the reasons cited, multiple witnesses, physiological evidence, and it's amazing how profoundly it affected all the witnesses. The entire family was really profoundly emotionally affected by this encounter which is a pattern we see a, a sighting can absolutely change your life and that's what we see in a lot of these cases and this next case i would say is no exception this one occurred in saybrook connecticut and what i like about this case is it probably would have gone unreported except for the fact that the witness miss mary m Starr was very well educated. She went to Yale University and had two master degrees. And this is what prompted UFO researchers to take her seriously, because this is a single witness case. And what she described is incredibly unusual. This UFO, it's so close to her. It's a very strangely described UFO. 
and even more strange are the humanoids she described. But a very lucid witness, and I think an important case. This next case occurred on December 16, 1957, and the main witness is Mary M. Starr. And as I said, she had two degrees, a master's degree from Yale. She was a teacher. She lived alone, and it was around 2 to 3 a.m. on December 16, 1957, when she had this incredible sighting, which I'll just let her describe in her own words. As Mary says, I was awakened by a bright light in my room. I looked out the window, and there was what I first thought was a crippled airplane in my back garden. But when I got my eyes really open, I saw that it was a cigar-shaped object, brightly lit and with square portholes hovering just above my clothesline. I could see men inside. So this object is very, very low. And it's huge. She says the object was about 25 feet long, gray or black, with square portholes. And she thought that it was about to crash, but then it became motionless. At this point, it's hovering about five feet above the ground. And looking through these portholes, she saw two figures walking by, passing each other, walking in opposite directions. And at some point she realized they could not be very tall. As she says, I could see that it, the object, was so shallow that the men could not have been more than three and a half or four feet tall. And they were very unusual looking. She said that their right arms were raised, they wore uniforms like stewards on a ship, and seemed to be carrying trays of some kind. But she said their heads were very unusual, looking almost squarish, red-orange, with a bright red bulb in the center, perhaps some kind of helmet, she thought. And then she saw a third figure walk right in front of the portholes. At this point, the entire craft began to glow. The portholes sort of faded away as the entire shell of the craft glowed more and more. She watched as an antenna began to extend from the near end. It began to sparkle and oscillate. And after about five minutes, this antenna device retracted and the object began to move in sharp right angle turns, almost hitting her blue spruce tree. The surface of this craft now looked blue-gray, and instead of portholes, she saw small circular lights outlining the perimeter. She said the craft from this perspective now looked oval, and she watched as it dipped and rose following the contour of the train below it. Then it tilted steeply and took off like a jet, but in complete silence and was gone. It's incredible the variety of the shapes of UFOs we see and the types of humanoids. And I think that case typifies this. And while it is a single witness case, there were in fact a bunch of sightings that followed in that area, which does lend a level of corroboration to it. it doesn't prove her case, which is anecdotal, but yeah, <laughs> I just found it a super fascinating case. And this next one, I think, is one of my favorite in this bunch because this one does have multiple witnesses and an enormous amount of physical evidence of different kinds. And by that I mean electromagnetic disturbances, landing traces, physiological effects, and more because this wasn't an isolated event. This one occurred in Marianland, Sweden, and it's a truly remarkable case. The main witness in this case is an electrical worker and former army officer by the name of Gideon Johansson. He was 67 years old. It was September 29, 1959, just before 7 p.m. Gideon was in his home when there was a weird power failure. So he went outside to check on it and saw that his son Rolf uh, was looking up. He told Rolf that all the lights were out, and his son pointed upwards and said, Yeah, but not up there. It's light enough up there. And as Gideon says in his own words, I looked up. Hovering above a three-story building was a blinding white light. I called through the window to my wife, telling her to run out of the house, because I thought an aircraft might be going to crash onto it. 
but the machine stopped still in the sky. At first we thought it was a helicopter, but we realized that it was not making any sound. The craft moved again, slowly descended, and it seemed to be heading for our garden. So Gideon's son is watching all this happen, and he screamed, Run, father, get out of the way, quick! But at this point, the craft rocked three times, turned to the right, actually smashed into a nearby maple tree, and then descended until it was hovering only one and a half feet above the ground. And it stayed there, kind of rocking like a boat on waves. At this point, Gideon was less than 10 feet away. He says the craft was about 15 feet wide and 12 feet high, was sort of an oval saucer with a metallic surface. There were four oval portholes which allowed him to see right inside. So it was pretty crudely instruct constructed. He thought that was kind of interesting. But as Gideon says, and I quote, Inside it, I saw an unusual white light, very compact. I have never seen anything like it. I can only describe it as being like sunshine on new fallen snow. I could see it shining through what appeared to be a large glass window, and inside it were two strange individuals. Their heads were very high crowned, and they had big, very beautiful eyes, full of intelligence, with a piercing look. I felt that they were looking right through me, reading my mind. I don't know how to explain it, but somehow I felt that I knew what had happened to them. They seemed to be friendly. Their noses were long and thin with small nostrils. They had small mouths and pointed chins with small lower jaws. They wore neat white uniforms with broad black belts crossed over their shoulders and chests. They were small men, about the size of a 14-year-old. I had plenty of time to take a good look at the craft and the people inside of it. It was a weird feeling that came over me seeing these creatures. They radiated something that made you feel transparent and kind of negative. Their faces were chalk white. It seemed like some apparatus was sticking out of their heads. So Gideon's son, Rolf, also saw the craft and the portholes, but he became frightened. He was too afraid to approach and said that he was actually scared stiff. In fact, later that day he had a track meet and was unable to run because he was so shaky. So this encounter is going on. Gideon is watching as one of them, these figures loosened his belt and bent down and began working on what Gideon believes to be a panel of some kind. One of the other beings kept looking around at the interior of the craft and back at him. And here's where it gets so interesting because Gideon says that he was not only seeing visually into the craft, he was getting strong mental or telepathic impressions of what the inside looked like. He could mentally see that this entity was repairing the windings on a strange barrel-shaped mechanism with a white illuminated dome on top, pictured here. Gideon had the impression that this, the light from the inside the craft was coming from this thing. And he also had the impression that the cause of the landing itself was to repair this mechanism. So all very interesting. And as Gideon says, I waved at them, smiled, and tried to give the impression that I was glad to see them and that they were welcome visitors, but they didn't return my friendly gestures. One of them stared at me for a few seconds, but apart from that, they took no notice of me. So after just a few moments, the craft floated upward and away. Gideon tried to follow it as it floated towards his gate for a distance of about 75 feet. At this point, it stopped. The lights inside the craft went out, and the craft just disappeared, quote, in a flash. It happened so quickly, Gideon wasn't sure which direction it went, he says it was just gone with a puff of air. Now, it turned out he and his son were not the only witnesses. Later, according to Gideon, a few of his neighbors approached him and said that they had also seen the object come right down in the direction of his house. Now, the power was later restored. They can't link the appearance of this craft directly to the power failure, but it certainly looks like it 
because Gideon learned that there was a strange gray-white glassy deposit found on three of the power lines, and this deposit extended about nine feet. And there were other strange medical effects on the witness himself. As Gideon says, After the incident, I had terrible prickling pains from the waist downwards. The pain disappeared after a few hours, and there was no redness or obvious irritation of the skin. But I couldn't go to bed after the incident. I just sat at the table making notes. I didn't feel well. All my glands became swollen and sore, and so did my testicles. I had some difficulty passing water. My body started to swell, and when I bent down, my face felt as if it was bursting. My body began to smell like something putrid. I lost my appetite, and food was tasteless. So this was severe enough that Gideon did go to the doctor, told him what happened. The doctor seemed skeptical and simply treated him by giving him a sedative. These problems did clear up, but months after the incident, Gideon saw that the maple tree, which had been damaged by the craft, was not budding like the other nearby trees, and in fact the tree never recovered. It eventually died and was cut down. Now, after talking to investigators, Gideon did reveal that he had had a few prior sightings, including seeing a strange craft in 1957. And way back in 1945, he had a very strange experience. He and his wife witnessed a mysterious rain of weird worms falling out of the sky. Uh, this does happen all across the world, weird objects falling out of a clear blue sky. In this case, it was worms, and they covered an area of about 300 by 900 feet. The neighbors also saw it and let out their hens to feast on the worms, but the hens would not touch them. And in fact, other crows and birds dived down to try to eat the worms, but they also wouldn't touch them. Now, Gideon did have the foresight to collect a few samples, and he sent them to a biologist who was not able to identify the species. So I just thought that was a weird side note. But the follow-up to this case is that Gideon was in fact psychoanalyzed and found to be totally normal. And according to Swedish researcher Anders Lilgren, he says, this is one of the best reports to have come out of Sweden. Yeah, that case does have a lot to say about ETs and how they behave. It being so close to the witness and he walks right up to this UFO, can see right inside it, sees the humanoids. But what I find most fascinating is that he had a telepathic link up to them. Could actually not only see physically inside the craft, but had very strong mental impressions or communication of what was going on inside as well. So that case, I think, does provide some really interesting insights. And here's another case, which again is not a one-off. A number of these do seem to be part of a larger complex of events. But this next case occurred in Lake Moville. This is in Minnesota. It's a really interesting case with multiple witnesses, as we shall see. It was in early August of 1962 when Mildred Anderson, her two brothers, Dwayne and Roger, their parents and the family dog Zipper were driving about 12 miles past Bagley to their home in Grand Forks. And without warning, their dog Zipper began to growl. And looking up, the entire family saw a green luminous object which seemed to be approaching their car on a parallel course. Now their father, who was driving, Kenneth Anderson, slowed down the car and the object was pretty close, approximately 70 feet or yards away. It was very large, almost as tall as a two-story building, they said, yellow-green, and it had this weird foggy haze surrounding it. It passed right by their car and then hovered over a bare patch of land, moved over to a wooded area, and made this long, curving half-circle maneuver off into the distance. So it was quite an amazing sighting, but little did they know this was just a precursor to a much more close-up sighting. It was three weeks later, Mildred Anderson and her two children, Roger Anderson 
and Marilyn Chenarides were visiting their vacation cabin, which was located on the shores of Lake Moville in Minnesota. Now, Roger had gone to bed, and Mildred was doing her daughter Marilyn's hair. Marilyn was the first to notice an odd glowing red object hovering over the boat dock, which was just 50 feet from their cabin. And they both stared in amazement as this object was clearly a flying saucer. And yeah, it was very close, hovering actually at the near landward side of the boat dock. The object itself was about 8 feet high, they estimate, and 35 feet wide. Pretty big. And the red light coming from it was so bright that it made the green paint on the boat dock appear almost brown and the water greenish black. Now on the side of the saucer they could see three large windows which were all lit up by a yellow light. And it was in two of the windows that they saw the silhouettes of three humanoid figures. Two were in the center window and one was on the left. And as Marilyn says in her own words, it appeared from nowhere. It appeared to be about eight feet tall and two car lengths long and was oval shaped with a smaller oval on top which had three triangular windows. Yellow light was shining from the windows and we could see the silhouettes of three human-like people. They were about the size of ordinary men and appeared to be staring at us. So both women, Marilyn and Mildred, had the impression that the men were directly watching them. And there was this apparent staring contest, which lasted a few minutes. Mildred became frightened and turned off the cabin lights, and immediately the lights in the UFO also went out. And this is when Mildred acted in a very strange way. She had this irresistible impulse to approach the object, and she quickly threw open the cabin door and ran from the cabin to the boat dock. Meanwhile, her daughter Marilyn started screaming hysterically for her to come back. But when Mildred got about halfway to the boat dock, the object lifted up very slowly, moved off at an angle, and then shot off into the distance and was gone. So that's the Lake Moville case. Very interesting. I'm not sure how I would react if a UFO came down that low, that close to my house. But I'd like to think I would react as this witness did, running out and running up to it. Perhaps not too close. <laughs> These craft can be quite hot and dangerous at times if you get too close. But yeah, I mean, she was close enough to see this thing right into the window. There's no doubt that this was something unusual. And this next case, I love this case for a number of reasons. This one occurred on Reunion Island. This is part of France. And initially this was thought to be a single witness case. It turns out that following his encounter, many other people started seeing the same craft and humanoid as well. And what I like about this case is this is another example of a type of humanoid people are describing all over the world which is most often described as the Michelin Man. It's called that because it shows a remarkable similarity to the Michelin Man tire commercials. So this is a very interesting case with physical evidence as well. This case occurred on July 31st, 1968, and the main witness is Luce Fontaine. At the time, he was 31 years old and worked as a farmer and he had gone out into the forest to pick some grass for his rabbits to eat. And I'll just let Luce describe in his own words this amazing sighting. As Luce says, Suddenly, I saw a sort of oval-shaped cabin in the clearing. It was 25 meters from me, and as though suspended at a height of 4 or 5 meters from the ground. The extremities of it were dark blue, the center part lighter, more transparent, rather like the windscreen of a Peugeot. Above and below, it had what looked like two glass feet of shining metal. In the center of the cabin were two individuals with their backs towards me. The one on the left turned right around and so faced me. He was standing, small, about 90 centimeters in height, 
enveloped from head to toe in a sort of one-piece overall, a bit like the suit worn by the Michelin man. The one on the right simply turned his head round towards me, but all the same, I had time to catch a glimpse of his face, which was partly masked by a sort of helmet. They both turned their backs to me, and there was a flash, as strong as the electric arc of a welding machine. Everything went white around me, a powerful heat was given off, and then, as it were, a sort of blast of wind. And a few seconds later, there was nothing there anymore. So this really freaked him out. I mean, he was sweating, breathing hard. He went and he examined the spot, saw no landing traces, nothing visible. But he went home, told his family. Uh, police were called. They examined the site, and they actually did find that this area had a higher level of radioactivity than surrounding areas. Luce himself was feeling somewhat unwell, so they also tested him and they found out that his clothes showed abnormally high radioactive readings. So it's quite a case involving very unusual looking humanoids, a very unusual looking craft, but most amazing is following this, numerous people on Reunion Island also started reporting this same apparent craft and the same apparent humanoids. It's quite an interesting case. That case did receive quite a bit of publicity. It was very well investigated and drew even more interest because people kept seeing this craft and humanoids. It's really remarkable. I love how these cases are usually not just a one-off, though in some cases they do appear to be just a singular event such as this next case, which really drew the attention of investigators. This occurred in Manchester, New Hampshire. And of all the cases in this bunch, this is easily one of the most dramatic because this lady was driving very late at night and came upon a UFO, which essentially chased her down the highway. This one may in fact involve an onboard experience, though she has no memory of it. But she certainly remembers coming around a corner and seeing this UFO blocking her pathway on the road, looking through the window of this very strangely described object, and seeing a humanoid. And what's also very interesting about this case is how she reacted when she had this experience. It was around 3 a.m. on November 2nd, 1973, when Lyndia Morrill, age 20, was driving northwest on Mast Road. This is Route 114A. And as she drove through the small town of Pinardville, she saw a bright star-like light. And it was weird because it was flashing red, green, and blue. Clearly not a star. So she began watching it as she drove along. And as she drove for about a mile, she began to approach the intersection of Route 114A and route 114, at which point the light winked out. And this is when she wondered if this could possibly be a UFO. It suddenly reappeared again, but even at this point she wasn't sure, and as she says, I didn't think anything of it. So as she drove along, this light continued to disappear and reappear, and as she drove through downtown Goffstown, it disappeared. This is just a tiny little town. But then, as she drove on down North Mast Road, outside of town, this object appeared directly in front of her on the road. As Lyndia says, it was right in front of me, and I started to get dizzy. My whole body kind of numbed. And as it came closer, I could see that it was honeycombed, orange and gold colored, and it felt like a magnet was pulling me towards it. So this craft was very low, right over the road. She saw an oval window on the upper left portion. The object itself was flashing red, green, and blue lights, what looked like rays or beams emanating from the center. It was also making a thin, high-pitched whine, which seemed to pierce her entire being and made her whole body tingle. So she began to feel a lot of fear and panic when she realized that she was unable to remove her hands from the steering wheel. 
She felt almost glued there. She says it felt like it was drawing her eyes upward and taking control of her body. And she felt herself beginning to lose awareness. In fact, she had no memory of driving a short portion by West Lawn Cemetery, even though she says she never took her eyes off the object. She felt like the UFO occupants were somehow retrieving and recording her memories. But coming back to full awareness, she realized at this point that she was speeding out of control. And it was then that she noticed the figure in the upper left window. She could only see the head, the upper body, and arms. She guessed that it was standing at some kind of control panel. Behind it, she could see a white background. But she said the being looked gray in color, and that the face had wrinkles or loose skin, kind of like an elephant. She said she saw two, quote, large egg-shaped eyes. They had dar large dark pupils. She, she saw a thin slit for a mouth. Doesn't recall seeing any nose or ears. So pretty much your typical gray. And in her head, she restored received a strong mental impression that it was telling her, quote, don't be afraid. And as Lindia says in her own words, my eyes were forced to it, and for a flash, it seemed like I saw a figure or body in it. I really thought it intended me to take away. Now she was later interviewed by researchers and reporters, and she admitted that she didn't really want to tell reporters about the figure because it sounded so crazy and unbelievable. But she felt absolutely certain that this UFO was trying to capture her. And in fact, as she's driving along and this thing is in front of her, she said the light was so bright she had to cover her eyes to see. And the noise was so loud she could barely stand it. At this point, she was less than one mile from her home, but she pulled onto the lawn of a stranger's house. It turned out to be Mr. and Mrs. Bowdoin. So she leaps from the car, and the Badoans owned a German shepherd. <laughs> this German shepherd lunged forward and growled at her. Now, normally, Lindia is afraid of dogs, but at this point, she was so panicked, she belted the dog with her hand, ran to the door, and began pounding on it. As Lindia says, I pounded on the door of the house and screamed as the object hovered over the back of the house. As soon as the man opened the door of the house, the feeling of awful buzzing and being drawn left me. So she screamed out, Help me! Help me! A UFO is right above me! It's trying to get me! I'm not drunk! I'm not on drugs! A UFO just tried to pick me up! Now the Badoans had been sleeping, and when they were woken up, they saw that it was now 4.30 a.m. They didn't believe Lindia at first, but stepping outside... They both saw this UFO. In fact, as Miss Bodoan says in her own words, we went out and we really saw that thing. At first it looked like a ball of fire with a blue haze around it, and it kept moving back and forth. So she quickly went inside, grabbed her Polaroid camera, and pointed it at the object. She was about to take a picture when immediately all the lights on the object went out. So she put the camera down and all the lights came back on. She kept trying to take a picture and finally did manage to take one, but nothing came out. They did call the police and an officer, Jubinville, responded. And according to Lindia, he didn't believe her at first either until she pointed at the object and he shouted out, Oh my God, there it is over the tree line. I don't believe it. Now, later in interviews with newspaper reporters, Officer Jubinville downplayed the sighting a little bit, and he said, I saw what she said she saw. It looked like an ordinary star, but it was an awfully strange star. It didn't look like a flying saucer or anything like that, but it did go out, and it moved probably a foot and turned colors, red, yellow, and back to red. So that is the Manchester, New Hampshire experience. And yeah, really, really interesting. And what I like about that case is when she saw this UFO and this humanoid and she felt it was after her, she did what I think most witnesses should do, get another witness. Drove right up onto someone's yard and pounded on their door, 
pulled them outside in time for them to see it too. And they actually called the police and the police officer saw it. So this is a very well verified case, one which I think deservedly got the attention of UFO researchers. And here's another case that was equally interesting to researchers for a number of reasons. It's quite well known, uh, certainly in the country where it occurred, and that was in Medellin, Spain. And this case is super interesting for a number of reasons, particularly because there were other witnesses. No one else saw the humanoids, because only one witness was close enough to see it. But what I like about this case is he was able to interact with the UFO occupants using the headlights of his car. It's quite a lengthy case in terms of how long he saw this object. And like in all these cases, he was very, very close up to it. And yeah, just a really interesting case all around. This case occurred on June 14, 1974, and the main witness is a farmer. His name is Santiago Pulido Romero. What's interesting about this sighting is it occurred not far from the very famous Medellin Castle in Spain. So Santiago is driving in the very early morning hours. It was still dark. And as Santiago says, A strong light struck me in the eyes. I saw a very strange pot-shaped object which was flying at a low altitude, 300 feet. It was traveling at an incredible velocity, as fast as I could follow with my eyes. I was at one side of the castle, and as the apparatus was coming towards me, an overwhelming fear filled my body. It occurred to me to turn out the lights of the car and to continue in second gear very slowly. My body was trembling all over. I tell you that you have to see how imposing a thing like that is. So this object was very brightly lit. In fact, it was casting light down on the ground like daylight. And this object would dart, zigzag, hover. Santiago said that the top part of the object was a pointed cone about 30 feet high, while the bottom was a rounded cylinder, transparent and quite large, about 60 feet wide. In many ways, it's your classic flying saucer and the whole thing was brightly illuminated with this intense yellow light. So as uh, Santiago said, he turned off his headlights, but the object began to follow him, and it was just about 200 feet off to the right. So he turned on his headlights again, at which point the object zoomed towards him. He flicked them off, and the object darted away, scooting way up into the sky until it was a little star-like light, and then would dart all over the place, hover, and do all these maneuvers. So he quickly arrives at his father's farm, his destination, at which point the object swooped down again, stopped, and hovered near the gate about 300 feet high, bobbing up and down. It was completely silent. Now, as Santiago says in his own words, my first intention was to shut myself up in the house. So I did this. Then... A little braver, I went out clutching a pitchfork, just in case. Imagine the fear which filled me so much that I even thought about running towards the mountain where I knew some very good places to hide. So at this point, he got a very good close look. Santiago could clearly see the bottom transparent section of this craft and was amazed to see men moving around inside it. And again, I'll just quote Santiago directly. I saw clearly three men, they were very tall, more than two meters, who were moving very stiffly as though under orders, and who had something on their heads like helmets or something similar. They moved about on foot. I tell you, it was something to see. If I live to be a thousand, I'll never forget that experience. Never, never, never. I swear that it was a terrible thing. You and all the rest can believe me or not, it's all the same to me. I know it is true, and that's all that matters. I was always very skeptical about such things. I used to think that they were the invention of idlers and dreamers, just a lot of nonsense. But now I know that there's something to it. They were beings from other worlds. What I saw, that apparatus thing, is not from this world 
because there cannot be anything even similar. I never saw the likes of such. So this did get a lot of publicity. Researchers interviewed Santiago, did some investigating, and found a number of other witnesses, including a young boy who described the same craft, as well as two neighbors of Santiago, and two traffic police officers in Medellin, who also saw this apparently the same object darting around in the sky. So that is the Medellin, Spain case, which again came pretty famous in that country, and I think deserves to be widely known because, wow, what a case. Now, here's another one which occurred in San Antonio, Texas. And of all the cases in this compilation, I think this might be one of the weirdest. And it's just such an amazing case involving, yes, only one witness, but he did have physiological reactions, the kind which cannot be faked. And he saw this UFO so close. I mean, this was right in front of his car. He could see right inside of it. He could see the inside of the craft. And he saw these humanoids, which were not your average humanoids. And that's putting it lightly. It was one evening around 9 p.m. in 1975 when the main witness, Alois J. Olenek, who was 48 years old, was driving along Mogford Road near the Bexar Atascosa line when he saw what he first thought was a helicopter hovering over a nearby cow pasture. He said it was glowing cherry red and was causing a, quote, terrific wind. And it was quite low. It was hovering only 30 feet above the field. And then, without warning, it came right for him. As Alois says, when the craft got directly over the top of my pickup, the lights went completely out and the engine was dead. As I was trying to get out of the pickup, I thought it was a chopper passing on top of me at first. Then, when they hovered over the top of me and I got a good look at it, I knew it was no chopper. I thought to myself, that's got to be a UFO. So he's looking at it and he could see that this craft had a spherical center and a saucer shape encircling the sphere. Pretty much your typical flying saucer. The bottom of the craft was highly polished metal and had a cherry red light on the bottom front. And it hovered over his truck for a good 20 seconds, long enough for him to see very, two very strange beings inside. He estimated that they were five feet tall. They had strangely tight, firm skin, he says. And as Alois says, they were bald with long, prominent ears and a long nose. Their eyes did not appear very plainly. They just looked like slits. Their skin was not like our skin. It appeared to me to look sort of like shark skin, sort of a gray color. There was no motor noise during this time that it was over my truck, just a whirring shriek of wind. It was very loud. It sounded to me like a cyclone. So he stared in wonder. He could see right into this craft and he saw that there were dash-like panels with T-shaped levers on the front, which the beings presumably used to maneuver the craft, he thought. Now this UFO was tipped towards him at an angle of about 40 degrees, which gave him even a better view. He said the transparent dome seemed to glow with reddish light, which made the interior of the craft and the beings themselves plainly visible. He could see nothing on their heads, but said that they did seem to be wearing some kind of shirt with a texture somewhat akin to leather. And as Alois says in his own words, they appeared to be just as interested in me as I was in them. One of the occupants, the one farthest from me, appeared to be the pilot and had his hands on the controls. He was looking up and away from me. The other occupant looked directly at me, a side view at my windshield and appeared to be observing me. I got a good look at both of them. They weren't human beings like we see here. So yeah, it was a quick sighting, a matter of seconds, and without warning, this craft abruptly departed. And as Alois says, it took off straight up. There was a terrible thrust that buffeted my pickup, and then it vanished almost instantly. 
was just like turning off a light bulb. Now, while this craft was uh, in his presence, he did notice a strong odor like burning copper or electrical wiring. This was while the craft was very near his truck. But in fact, it lingered for days afterwards. And he discovered something else. His eyes were very painful. And in fact, he was partially blinded, as though he had looked at an arc welder, he said, without protection. In fact, it was bad enough that he sought medical attention, and he had to wear dark sunglasses to protect his eyes in the days that followed. But yeah, he is absolutely convinced this was a UFO, as he says. It was not from this world. It was something, but I don't know what. I feel like they got a good look at me and maybe got my picture or something and then turned off their lights and vanished. He said that the whole incident left him, quote, very shaken. So that's the San Antonio, Texas case. And yeah, as you can see from the description of the main witness, not your average gray by any means. I'm not sure I've heard ETs described quite like that, but there are a few cases certainly similar to that. However, this next case, no, I don't think I've heard anyone describe a UFO shaped in quite this way, or for that matter, a humanoid quite like this, or how it behaved. So this next case, which occurred in Tucson, Arizona, is a real doozy. It involves multiple witnesses, it's quite a long, enduring sighting as well. And yeah, the details are just amazing. This next case comes from APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, and it occurred on February 10, 1977. The main witness is Lois Stovall. It was 7.30 p.m. and she was sitting in her living room at her home at 2150 Poquita Vista in Tucson when she saw a fiery glowing object rising up from behind the Lillian Cavett Elementary School, which was right near her home. And it immediately caught her attention because it was just a beautiful light. And she watched as it curved around the school building and moving at treetop level, approached directly to her house, hovering at one point only inches above the ground on the school lawn across the street. This is when Lo Lois called out to her grandmother, Alice Buckner, and they both watched as this object rose up, came even closer, and hovered over their yard. And it stayed there for a good full two minutes, long enough for them both to go outside and walk right up to it. They approached within 50 feet of this object. They now got a clear view of it and saw that it was shaped like a vertical capsule cylindrical with blunt round ends both on the bottom and the top. The bottom was emitting a bright flame-like light which was red, white, and blue. The front section was transparent and had what looked like vertical bars running from top to bottom. But it was what be was behind those bars that really startled the most it was a humanoid figure. And in fact Alice shouted out, there's a man in there. She said this figure was gray in color, was wearing something, it looked like a puffed up suit with rings or ridges around the arms and legs, it reminded them very much of a spacesuit. This figure looked as though it was slightly crouched and appeared to be holding onto controls perhaps of some t kind, though they really couldn't see any. But they did feel that this figure was very short, about the size, they estimate, of a six-year-old child and it almost completely filled the cabin space. This was quite small. So Alice approached and walked right under this craft, and it was only two feet over her head. She actually wanted to reach out and touch it, but it was just out of reach. But she could see at this point that there was a sort of glass covering over this opening, and the bars were in front of it. And as she tried to touch it, it rose up, and Alice could now see a face plate on this figure and the glimmerings of what she believed was a face. So they both watched this object departed, passing over the carport, over the roof of the house, and passed just over the telephone lines behind their house and began to climb up into the sky. They watched it move slowly away and up until it became a glittering star-like object high in the sky. 
And also what's very interesting is that both Lois and Alice said that three helicopters were in the area and were actually crisscrossing the school property as if searching for the object, but they did not appear to see it hovering over their yard. In fact, as this object scooted up into the sky and moved away, they saw three other helicopters, a total of six helicopters. So after this all occurred, they did call the police, who denied having any helicopters in the area, and said that they actually only have three helicopters. None were out that night, and they said that they had never even flown three helicopters at once. So meanwhile, while uh, Alice and Lois were watching them, this object, their neighbor at 2202 East Poquita Vista was brushing her teeth and she saw the object move over the driveway. She described the same object and said it was about six feet six inches tall and maybe about two feet six inches wide and she also saw a figure behind the glass. She saw Alice and Lois watched the object. She also confirmed the presence of helicopters and she called a TV station but they showed no interest in the sighting. Now, investigators did interview all the witnesses and the investigators contacted Davis Monthan Air Force Base, which was only three miles away. Davis Monthan denied any knowledge of this incident, said they had no helicopters out. The investigators also contacted nearby Tucson Airport, who also denied any knowledge and said that they saw nothing. So a pretty amazing sighting, and it's somewhat corroborated because 11 days later, numerous residents described another UFO seen here, which flew around Tucson at treetop level, so low, witnesses thought it might actually strike the electric lines. So that's the Tucson case, which again I like for a number of reasons, multiple witnesses. I'm very much intrigued by the fact that they, all the witnesses, talked about the helicopter activity going on during the sighting with these six helicopters crisscrossing the area clearly searching for this UFO and occupant though weren't able to see it even though they were quite close. That makes me wonder are the ETs able to shield themselves from view from whoever they don't want to see them and show themselves to who they do want to see them. So it looks like that's what's happening in this case. But what I also like about this case is that the witness was able to get within two feet of the object. <laughs> that is so unusual. A really strange case. Now this next case got an enormous amount of publicity. You may have heard of it before. It occurred in Dorset, England. And it was again your typical case of a UFO dropping down right over a person's home, over her backyard in this case. And yes, this is a single witness case, but she saw it so close up. She's such a clearly sincere, honest witness. And she did have apparent physiological effects as well. It's a truly interesting case. It was around 11 p.m. in September of 1977 when Ethel May Field, age 62, stepped out of her home on Seaview Road this was at Parkstone Pool in Dorset. And inside her home, her husband Maurice and daughter Teresa were watching TV. Ethel had stepped out to bring the clothes in off the clothesline. And this is when she heard a humming noise and looking up, saw a round object with a dome on top approaching her. It was gray in color, she said, but brilliantly lit with blue, yellow beams of light coming downward from the perimeter. She estimates that it was about 22 feet wide as it covered her entire backyard and it was so low because she could easily see windows and through the windows to occupants. And in fact, the object was so bright she held her hands out, palm outwards, to shield herself from the light. She could actually feel heat on her hands and the ground itself actually seemed to tremble as this object arrived. And again, I'll just let Ethel describe it in her own words. It's always great to hear what the witness says. And as she says, There was a vibration in the ground. I thought it was an earthquake. I also heard a humming noise. And I looked to my left from where it was coming. And I saw this large disc-shaped object flying towards me. 
The object was as big as a bus. It seemed to be swooping upwards across the gardens as if it had come out of the sea, which is in that direction. It was very bright and shiny and looked to be made of metal. It came close and hovered just a short distance away, tilted slightly downwards. I could see there was a dome on top around which looked to be windows of some kind. Inside were two figures, one at a control panel and the other pointing at me. She said the two occupants looked normal in size but were wearing silver suits which covered everything except their faces. She wasn't sure, but they both seemed to be male, had very slender facial features. The figure on the right was operating, she said, what looked like a control panel, but the other was staring directly at her and making sort of a down-pointing gesture at her, which she interpreted, interpreted as an intention to come in for a landing. And as Ethel says, the light from the dome was terribly bright. I held up my hands to shield my eyes and watched from between my fingers. I saw one of the occupants pointing down, and I thought for a horrible moment it was going to land. So now alarmed, she retreated to the doorway and turned around just in time to watch this object speed away. And she estimates that the entire sighting lasted only about 20 to 30 seconds. She immediately told her husband and daughter, who did not believe her, and actually laughed at her. Uh, Ethel was not happy about that, and she said she was going to call the newspapers. And at this point, her family convinced her not to, as they said people would ridicule her. But Ethel was determined to tell someone, and later she did contact UFO researchers. And here was an interesting sort of detail, because in the week following her experience, she said that the palms of her hands became raw and painful, to the point where the skin actually peeled. She wasn't sure if this was directly linked or connected to her UFO encounter, but researchers felt that it was entirely possible, given that she did feel heat, had put her hands up, palms facing this object, and that there are many other cases where this sort of physiological effect has occurred. That's the Dorset, England, England case with Ethel May Field. And I like that case because it typifies this category. She saw this UFO so close, it was right over her backyard. It was a fairly brief case, yes, but long enough for her to get a good look at these humanoids who looked human. These were what we would probably call the human-like ET, sometimes called Nordics. I don't really like that term, it's not entirely accurate. But in her case, it was. Yeah, these were blonde-haired beings, apparently. Um, absolutely human-looking. And I think clearly showing themselves off on purpose. It's a really unusual case. Now, this next case is actually a cluster of sightings. And I love this case for reasons I will tell you right now. <laughs> this occurred in San Fernando Valley in California over a pretty sharply defined area. This includes Woodland Hills, Canoga Park, Chatsworth, and Reseda. And what I like about this is I actually lived in this area for many years, decades. My brother and sister-in-law lived in Woodland Hills. I lived in a condo in Canoga Park and in a tiny little home in Reseda. So all the locations that are mentioned in this particular cluster of sightings. I know all of them, every intersection, <laughs> um, all of the streets, so I'm quite familiar with this area. In fact, I was living just a few miles away. I was a little kid at the time, so I didn't see any of this activity. Boy, if I had, my life might have been quite different. But again, this involves a series of sightings, a flap of UFO activity, over a period of a week or two, which was quite intense involving 10 or so events with some 30 witnesses and one involving an apparent onboard experience and missing time but one involving an absolute sighting of humanoids seen through the window of a UFO. It was in July through August of 1979 that an amazing series of sightings and encounters occurred over the space of about a week 
and was really only a few miles wide, with at least, as I said, 28 witnesses. I'm just going to breeze through these pretty quickly because there's quite a few. <laughs> On July 21st, Sandra P. and her four young children saw a white glowing sphere move over their home in Simi Valley. This was a little bit farther to the north as most of these sightings. But later in the evening, Sandra saw it again, and it now blinked white, red, green, and blue lights. And this was the beginning of an amazing series of sightings. July 25th was really the big night. It was at 2 a.m. that morning when four teenagers said that they saw a low-flying glowing object pass low over the intersection of Shoup and Van Owen. They lit up the whole area and was so low they could hear a soft whirring noise. It was about an hour and 15 minutes later when Mickey Childers was woken up in her home, which was at the intersection of Valley Circle Boulevard and Highlander Road. This is very near Chatsworth Reservoir. And she was woken up by the sound of barking dogs. And living on the second story, she looked out to see if there were any prowlers. And she saw this object hovering near the intersection of Platte and Satikoy. So she woke up her son, Dean, who was a college student, very interested in astronomy, and together they observed the object through a telescope, and they could see that it was surrounded by sparkling white lights. They actually watched it for about 25 minutes as it moved silently upwards, turning green, red, and then blue. The next morning they did call the police, but forgot about it until there was a lot of publicity of this sighting in the newspaper, and that's when they recalled it and contacted investigators. So Walt Greenewald investigated these cases, and he started uncovering a number of other witnesses. One of them was Sherry N., a cocktail wait waitress. It was on the same night, around the same time, 3.15 a.m., Sherry was driving through Chatsworth, and this is only a few miles from where Mickey Childers and her son Dean saw the UFO. And she saw this bright light coming down from above, she was actually stopped at a red light on Topanga Canyon Boulevard and Plummer Street when the object swooped down towards her. So she freaked out. She actually ran the red light and raced home. And when she got home, she realized that she couldn't account for a half hour of time. So she had missing time. And the next morning, she said she had pretty severe nausea and strange blisters on her legs. And the sightings were continuing on this day. Morning arrived, it was around 7.15 a.m. when Ira Pearson and three friends saw what's apparently the same object from the intersection of Oso and Satikoy. It was metallic, a cylinder shape, 6 feet wide, 12 feet long, and hovered in a diagonal position for 5 minutes before darting away. But while they were watching it, they actually saw a police car stop Two officers exited and watched the object through binoculars. So that night, again still July 25th, 11 p.m., the Hetman family saw weird lights, which they estimated were hovering over the intersection of Fallbrook and Dolorosa in Woodland Hills. I know all these intersections. This is so interesting to me. And it was about one week later when there was another wave of sightings pretty much all on August 3rd and 4th. On August 3rd, around 12.10 a.m., a couple by the name of Angelo and Nelly Mortillaro were in their home in Reseda. This is near the intersection of Victory and Tampa. And they saw a saucer-shaped object move over Hamlin Street and Victory Boulevard. They said it was covered with white blinking lights and was totally silent. Later that uh, evening, actually, at 9.15 a.m., Miss Evelyn Palmer was driving near Corbin and Nordoff, passing the intersections of Roscoe and Lenark as well. And as she drove home, she saw this object. She got, got her binoculars when she reached home and saw it was a silver saucer, which she estimates was about 200 feet in diameter. She watched it for 10 minutes before it darted off. Now, Walt Greenewald was triangulating all these sightings and the descriptions. And based on her testimony and the testimony of others, 
He thinks she overestimated its size and was probably closer to 80 feet. But she also called the local news, who said that they had received several calls about it. So these are not all the witnesses, by any means. And it was around the same time that uh, Mrs. Peacock observed apparently the same object from Runnymede and Rhea in Canoga Park. And she also confirmed the description and said it had 20 blinking lights on the bottom. She watched it for about five minutes. Now she's just one mile west of Miss Evelyn Palmer. So August 4th, 8.30 a.m., this is the next day, a gentleman by the name of George observed apparently the same UFO hovering over Canoga Park. And here's the really interesting sighting involving humanoids. Because it was that evening, again, August 4th, around 10.35 p.m., when Maria Artura, who was 60 years old, and her grandson were in Canoga Park, and they saw this UFO come swooping down towards them from the Topanga Canyon area. And it hovered just above the apartment building across the street. They said it was a classic saucer with blinking yellow lights and a transparent dome on top. And looking through the dome, she could see the silhouette of two humanoid figures looking down at her. She said they looked totally human, except they had very large, oversized heads. The craft tilted to one side, then the other, became horizontal, and then flew off to the west. Now she started talking about this and learned that four of her neighbors also reported apparently seeing the same object. And it was some 20 days later when there was still another sighting. A Mr. Annapol was at Sherman Way and Royer Street, and he says he observed a pink-purple disc at low altitude. So again, researcher Walt Greenwald investigated all of these cases, and he said it was a very unusual and intense wave of sightings. And he later contacted the cocktail waitress, Sherry, who had had a missing, under, missing time, and arranged for her to go under hypnosis, which she did. And she recalled being taken inside a craft, laid out on a metal table, and examined by a creature which she couldn't see very well, other than she said it had a small head, no nose or mouth, and she's pretty sure she felt three fingers on each of its hands as it examined her. So certainly a very interesting cluster of sightings, and a good reminder that one person's sighting is another person's direct encounter with humanoids, and perhaps even an onboard experience. So that is the San Fernando case, a whole wave of sightings, a uh, really interesting series of events that with so many witnesses and so many separate sightings, there's no doubt something very unusual was happening there. But of all the cases in this compilation, I have to say this next one really caught my attention. It's a bit of an outlier. The witness in this case has insisted upon absolute anonymity does not want her exact location to be revealed, but this did occur on the outskirts of Mobile, Alabama. And what I like about this case is its unusual aspects. This was a very unusual UFO. It's absolutely humongous. And where in most of these cases people see one, two, or maybe three humanoids. In this case, the witness saw quite a bit more than that. <laughs> We're talking about a crowd of humanoids, 20 or 30 or more. That alone makes this case really unusual. And there's other unusual aspects to it, as we shall see. This case occurred on February 3rd, 1983. And again, the witness is anonymous, but is referred to as Pat. And this was in Mobile, Alabama. She doesn't want to say exactly where, but she had left Highway 90 and was heading towards her home in Mobile when she heard a strange explosion, at which point her car began to vibrate in a very strange way. In fact, it was enough that she pulled over, stopped, leaned out the window to check the car, but noticed nothing wrong. And as she continued to drive, she noticed that the woods ahead of her were all lit up. And she became concerned. She thought that there was some sort of helicopter search. So she stopped the car and looked up, and saw this enormous object about a half mile to the west. And it was huge. 
This object was seven to eight stories high, maybe 80 feet, and more than 200 feet wide. She could now hear a high-pitched sound and saw that the wind was whipping the trees around, and the object moved closer. As it came up to her, all sound stopped. And Pat, who had been quite frightened, now felt no fear at all. In fact, she got out of the car and viewed this object, and she said she felt like a child with, quote, unbelievable happiness. So she was entranced, and she looked up at the top deck where she saw long windows, one long window, more than 50 feet long. She was amazed at what she saw. There were about 30 people, more or less, walking around as if changing shifts. Now they showed no signs of noticing her, did not look down at her, but she said that they were very pale, all of them were dressed in white one-piece suits. They were of normal height, about 5'10", thin, but had very large chests, looked strong, they had prominent foreheads, and no hair. She also noticed something else. They seemed to move with this incredible grace. So she's looking at this craft. She could see inside of it. She said it looked very sterile, white with curved walls. She said there was a big opening of a window in front of it it was or a door of some kind but below the top deck she saw another window that looked opaque or tinted she saw below the craft on the street what looked like strange tubular or rectangular equipment strange eye beams and she said the craft in some ways reminded her of a submarine and she thought it might have been constructed on earth so she's not entirely convinced this was ETs at this point. But the very bottom deck did appear to be an observation deck, and she saw more beings there. And these were peering down at her. This craft had white spotlights, and on the side, blue and red lights that sent beams of light both up into the sky and down into the ground. And in fact, the light from the craft was bright enough to illuminate the ground below. So in interviews with researchers, they learned something really interesting. She admitted to dreaming about UFOs, not only after, but before this incident. And these dreams included her going on board a craft, being not only physically examined, but emotionally examined. She's still unsure you know, whether this was genuinely ETs or not. Uh, but yeah, it is, was an experience that affected her so profoundly, she insisted on absolute anonymity. So that's the Mobile, Alabama case. Yeah, super strange. I find it very intriguing that she thought perhaps that this was reverse engineered human craft, which is certainly a possibility. We know that this does happen. We can't rule it out. Uh, I'm leaning towards this being extraterrestrial because she said that before... This encounter and after, she was having dreams of being on board UFOs, being physically examined, emotionally examined. I don't know, it's hard to say, because there are some aspects to the way she described this UFO that make it sound like it might be a reverse engineered craft. I'll let you make up your own mind about it, but it's certainly something to be aware of when investigating these UFO cases. We do have some of this technology and it has been reverse engineered to a certain extent. Now moving on to the last and final case which I love because it's quite recent and involves multiple witnesses. They were able to observe this object through binoculars for quite a long period of time and that I think makes this case super interesting. This one occurred in Westerville, Ohio. This final case occurred in October 2003, again in Westerville, Ohio. This was reported to New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center. And I'll just quote the witness directly because he explained his sighting very lucidly. As the witness says, My wife and I were sitting on our screened porch at our home in Westerville, Ohio, which faces east. At around 6 p.m. on an October evening, we saw a large, bright, stationary object in the southeast sky. I tended to ignore it for a while. I thought that perhaps it was a communication satellite. 
but I went into the house and I got my 7x50 field glasses to help identify the object. And it was no helicopter, commercial or military aircraft, and certainly not one of those blimps that occasionally make its way down to the Ohio State University to cover a football game. As far as I could tell, it didn't move. There was no noise coming from it. This object was perhaps 50 to 60 feet in diameter. The setting sun was reflecting off the object and made it somewhat difficult to see. But as far as I could tell, there were no external lights. There were five large rectangular windows that took up much of the space of this object, and there was a yellow glow in the interior. I saw a person dressed in a light-colored, single-piece suit from the neck down. The person had a head, two arms, and a body. He appeared to move only once and only slightly. It stood next to what appeared to be a file cabinet, which stood as tall as his shoulder. There was some mass around these windows, but nothing that would constitute the body of some aircraft. The next evening, my wife and I saw the same object. I called a local television station to report what I had seen, and if anybody had any idea what it was, the lady gave me some answer, and that was the last that I heard of this object. As far as I know, nothing was reported on any television news broadcast or printed in the Columbus Dispatch. Surely others in the area must have seen this object. I know what I saw, but I have no idea what I saw. There you go, another super fascinating case. I think there probably are more witnesses to it, as the original witness describes. But again, most people don't step forward and talk about this. Most people don't know about organizations like MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, or New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center, and even if you call the police, the police don't usually take these accounts seriously either. So these 14 cases are definitely just the tip of the iceberg. I know of many other cases, and I would have included them here, but we'd be here all day. <laughs> but yeah, what I like about these cases is I think they have something important to say about the UFO phenomena, the ET agenda, and how... UFO occupants behave on this planet. I think one thing it shows is that this is an ongoing phenomena. I mean, here these cases reach back to the 1950s all the way up to the 2000s. I also think it's important to note that these cases are coming from all over the world. I'm very much intrigued by the vast differences we see in a lot of the shapes of these craft. And also, even more interestingly, the different types of humanoids we see. And yet, they're all humanoid. That, I think, is very significant and perhaps the most important takeaway from all this because what we are seeing are people. People very much like us. We have quite a bit of variation in our own people here on Earth. And I think we're seeing that with these ETs. And this speaks to the message that so many contactees get directly from the ETs which is, we are you, you are us, we are all one. Perhaps we really shouldn't even be calling them aliens, because let's face it, to anyone else on any other planet, we're aliens. And really, we are all just people. So I think that's the real takeaway from cases like these. But yeah, the other really interesting aspect I find is that these are such low-level sightings uh, so in your face, so clearly wanting to be seen, that I think this speaks towards the ET agenda of them wanting to announce their presence and let people know that they are here. To quote ancient aliens, <laughs> we are not alone, we have never been alone. And the ETs are doing their part towards disclosure. It's already happened. They've showed themselves. If you don't think disclosure has happened, all you have to do is take a look at the vast database of cases like these. Uh, we know UFOs are real. The evidence is there for those who have the courage to objectively examine it. So that's why I wanted to do this episode today. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it interesting and perhaps learned something. I really want to thank you once again for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, signing off with Keep asking questions, keep searching for the truth, and most important of all, keep having fun. 
Until next time.